I'll count you down here, but then I'm going to give you the three, two, one, you're live. And then the two minutes, the one minute and the 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. All right. Stand by. Here we go in <sighs> three, two, one, you're live. Hello, everyone. This is a Jeremiah show. My name is Mike Gormley. Jeremiah is lost. I would hope he'll show up at some point. Uh, we have with us today, <laughs> uh, Catherine, better known as Cat Dull. Hi, Catherine. Hello. And a special guest, Louise Goffin. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Where are you these days? I'm in Los Angeles. Are you? Are you living in Los Angeles? Yes, I am. Ah. This is my home. I, I thought you moved at some point to different parts of the country. I was in Nashville for a year and, uh, and you know, I was in London for years, but yeah, this has been my home for a long time. Great. Well, good. Well, um, the Jeremiah show has a couple of components to it. One is about food, which we will not get to. And one is obviously about music, which we are going to talk to at length. Uh, and uh, okay. it's, it's great to see you. I don't know if you remember, we used to bump into each other a little bit at Highland Grounds. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, it was, that was a great time. It was, it was amazing. Did anything, did you, did anything, Highland Grounds in, in LA was a place that on Thursday nights, uh, singer-songwriters galore would come down and they'd sign up for, I think, two songs starting at 7.30 and going to 11. And great songwriters uh, would show up and great singers. And it would be, be this amazing night. And then you, and it would, there was a big uh, outdoor patio with a huge tree in it. And you would, um, you would know if something was going on inside, if all the writers were inside. You knew if it was a little mediocre if they were all out in that patio. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I remember playing there. I think I just did it once though, but I remember it had quite high ceilings on the inside and uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's cool still place. there, but it's a restaurant. It's under some sort of, uh, um, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it was a restaurant. What it's doing now. Yeah. I don't know, but um, anyway. Uh, so it's great to see you. You're, you're, um, you've been, you've got like, what is it? 10 albums uh, now under your belt uh, over the years? Yeah, I just keep doing them. Can't <laughs> stop. <laughs> Why? Because you got nothing else to do? You just thought you'd make an album? And... Um, well, yeah, pretty compulsive, I guess. I mean, my whole life, the whole concept of writing a bunch of songs, figuring out how they all fit together and telling a story. Um, and yeah, I, I love doing that. But lately, I've been doing so many other projects and juggling because you know, I do a lot of editing. I'm doing my own podcast and uh, things take time. So yeah, you're yeah. doing a master class as well, which you've done before, right? You got one. Another yeah, one. I, I've been doing that over the, over the years for the last eight or nine years or so. Uh, I was first asked to do it with Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp and they wanted me to come and do a master class as a songwriter. And then I just started doing them here and there really just uh, you know, sometimes even once a year, I do them at Village Recording Studios and, you know, they always went so well. And then people had me come out to London and do one. And I did one in Las Vegas and I did one in New York and uh, they just go really well. And they're, they're really fun. I enjoy doing it. So lately I've been offering them online since I'm home anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's been a great hang. It's also really nice to be able to pay it forward for some of the things that I felt like they slowed me down and, and self doubts and all of that to really help people get over those humps and get to their writing. Is it, um, uh, like how many people are usually online? How many, and from all over the world now because it's online or what? Uh, well, you know, I usually limit the classes unless it's a Q and A. Um, but I usually limit them to like 20, 25 people because I want everyone to have time to be able to, you know, get quality time. Um, I've seen some teachers do it in a way where they have a lot of people, but they roll it over. They'll have, you know, people sign in on the first hour and then more people sign in on the next hour and it kind of rolls all through the, the hours. But um, 
yeah, I've just kept it to like 20, 25 people, which is great, you know? Yeah, that's a good size. Yeah. Does it range from beginners to professionals, uh, the, you know, people on songwriting? Um, it ranges completely. I mean, most of the people there seem to have experience with writing songs, but there's some really young up and coming people. They just happen to be really good. I'm always so surprised at, you know, the, the level of 18 year olds, you know? Yeah, they're seeing a lot these days. Yeah, and they really study, you know, they, there's a lot online. We, we didn't have as much to, you know, constantly bathe our bodies and souls in. You know, you can go on YouTube and just see great performances by anybody and, and start learning from the best. Yeah, it is, and then there's schools. I mean, there's Berkeley's been around for a long time in Boston, but there are schools like that in almost every city now, and it involves right down to production and writing and performing? Absolutely, yeah. My son went to a school, well, he went to Berkeley and then he went to the Black, Blackbird Academy in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, which was recording engineering. And he had such a great time there that he was helping me in my studio here in LA. And he said, mom, if you went to this school in Nashville, it would change your life, you know? And I didn't think I would go because I thought, when, when am I going to find six months to go to audio engineering school? But I was actually in Nashville that summer with his younger brother for just an engineering camp for a week for his, his younger brother. And then I sat in my older son's class and then I didn't want to leave. I just said, can I enroll? And they said, sure. So I just sent my younger son home to his dad and I stayed in Nashville and enrolled myself uh, and there you go. That's Can you awesome. hold on one sec? I got my dog's gonna scratch at the window. It'll just, I'm just gonna open the door. That's okay, sure. <laughs> Look at the piano in the background. I know, it's oh, gorgeous. Nice piano. That's a beautiful You know, piano. dogs will be dogs. Yeah, I understand. That's a beautiful piano back there. What's, what is that? Oh, it's a Steinway. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. I, I got it in 2008 and, um, it was, uh, it had been in a warehouse in New York. I think its original year is maybe 1916. And it had the same owner. Um, and I was actually looking for a stand-up piano, a Yamaha, yeah. but that was in, that was in the store. <laughs> and I played it and it, I just said, oh, I, I'm gonna make payments for years. I have to have this piano. <laughs> so I got it. And, and it, it's, it was a great investment. Like my kids learned how to play on it. And I've done a lot of great writing on it. It's brought a lot of joy. Is that, is that your main instrument? Because somehow I picture you with a guitar as well. Uh, I, would, I would say that uh, piano is probably my main instrument, but I do, I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I play guitar and ukulele and a bit of banjo and drums and bass. But you've you've played guitar with other artists. Like I think you, you toured with Tears for it was a guitar you were playing for Tears for Fear? Yeah, yeah, I did. I that was my uh yeah, it was my rock moment. Yeah. <laughs> you've had Stri one? striking <laughs> well, yeah, striking poses as as you know, the <laughs> rhythm sometimes lead guitarists. I had a couple of solos in that band, but that's awesome. that's yeah. that just like a fun time. It was a fun time. It was uh it was a lot of fun. I don't know if I'm built for touring. Uh, I love it for a certain amount of time. And then the creative part of me gets restless because rather than create something new, you're just performing the same thing over and over again. Um, yeah, that must get, get, get boring. Well, it doesn't get boring, but it, 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 it's, a, it's super exciting the time you're on stage, but then you've got the other hours. That's the part that was always hard for me. I think any touring musician will say they get paid not for the two hours they're on stage. They get paid to be away from their loved ones, their dog, their house, you know, their kids. Mm -hmm. That's that's really where the toil comes in. Weeks and months on time at at a time. Yeah, I mean, it was a four month tour, and by the third 
you know, after the third month, I was like, okay, I've experienced this. I'm done. I'm ready to go home. And and then there was another month, you know. So I guess I'm I guess I'm a lightweight. Before you go, no, I no, I'm <laughs> not a lightweight. You're you're, you're normal. Yeah. Um, Thank I, you. I, I would imagine when you're looking at the tour before you get started, maybe rehearsals or whatever you're going, oh man, I'm going to be in all these cool cities. I'm going to tour the world, blah, blah, blah. And then you come in town and you do a sound check and you do a show and you leave town, right? It's not just, you just don't get to hang out. Yeah, there were pretty good hangs on that tour though. I got to say it was, uh, it was pretty high level. Uh, I mean, we had, we were on a bus, not a plane, but you know, we we did a European leg of the tour. So we were in major cities like Paris and Madrid. You know, in Madrid, we had dinner with Pedro Alma, Um, I never know how to say it. Alma, Alma, how do you say his last name, the pronunciation? Pedro Almaldovar, the- uh, yeah, That's it. Yeah. That's it. You yeah, got it. He, that was a great hang. Um, and, Oh, actually, that was with Brian Ferry. I've got that wrong. That was on a TV tour with Brian Ferry shortly before the Tears for Fears tour. But the Tears for Fears tour was still after the show. Nice dinners with the band, you know. I think I put on a couple of pounds because it was always great wine at dinners. That's Nothing great. wrong with that. <laughs> what about your own tours? What, what have you have you done? A I've lot never been tours? much of a, a touring musician. Um, I, you know, I toured when I first came out when I was nineteen, and the record company gave me tour support. Uh, I, 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 I paid for that later, though. I paid for the fact that I didn't really like trudging out on the road because it became a time in music where it really mattered in terms of making money. Like you couldn't make money just selling records. You had to go out and tour because that's where, you know, ticket sales were where the money was. Right. And I hadn't really invested my time there. I was like the Beatles. I want to be in the studio. I want to be writing songs and, cre and creating records. Um, but, but what it did do for me where I felt like I had a, a, you know, a little bit of an extra bit of preparation where some of those bands who got used to that level of touring when the time came where they had to strip down and be able to play sets by themselves, they weren't so prepare prepared. Yeah. They didn't know how to play without a band. And, and I did. So, um, you know, it all comes around, whatever you do, you make it work for you one way or another. Yeah, that's true. Getting back and, and Kat, I'm sorry to jump in <laughs> when you're ready. I just want to ask, I want to get oh, back yeah. to the, the songwriting I mean, the uh, master class. Well, first, what are mm -hmm. the dates of the master class coming up? Um, it, it's, I think it's all, all the Tuesdays in, in March. Oh, that's cool. That's easy. Yeah. In yeah. Uh, what do you do if you're, you're at a, how do you get started in a master class? Where do you start to tell a songwriter what to do or how to do it? And then, of course, it depends on where they are, but what, what's your starting point? Mm -hmm. Well, my starting point is really to stay quiet and listen, you know, listen, listen really to the silence. Mm -hmm. And uh, something I started doing in these master classes, which, you know, I was, it was really a spontaneous thought to do it, but people got so much out of it, uh, which is I would do like a five minute meditation at the beginning. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, so much, so much of the issue with people's, doing songwriting is their inner talk the inner talk of i'm not good enough or this is not a good enough of an idea or i can't really play that well or i can't really sing this is this is what people are starting their their songwriting with you know mm -hmm. and i mean even to get people to have the courage to sign up for a class they just talk themselves out of it before they even do that. So like the first step is if you've signed up for the class, you're making this commitment to yourself to just save that time every Tuesday. You know, it's 90 minutes, save that time. And then maybe there's some homework in between. And, you know, I really, I think they find out quickly that I don't bite and they like that, you know? I'm all about empowering and, um, you know, 
giving people confidence and tools. Um, so yeah, I start off with just clearing the space and then really talking the way you talk. Like, don't try to be all fancy, you know? Don't try to get to the product first. Just, yeah. just you know, be in this flow, like breathing. And then you edit yourself later, you know? And I talk about the shape of the song because, you know, too much information that's all mathematical is no good. <laughs> we don't want that. But, you know, I have people look at songs they love and and look at the shape of it. It actually has a shape. It might come up here. It might have a pre-chorus. And then sometimes I'll have them write a song in the same shape. It doesn't matter. Anything else about the song doesn't matter. Just match the shape of the song you love. Mm -hmm. And they get some great results. It's, it's amazing. They can't even believe they wrote that song. And I said, what, how did you do that? And they said, oh, oh, oh. You're them, how'd you do that? <laughs> and they're going, oh, well, that meditation the first day or something, I don't know, you know, that it's, uh, I find if you believe in people, it makes it easier for them to believe in themselves, you know, so. Uh, Louise, we may have to call security because evidently somebody's come into the studio. We don't know. I see. <laughs> yeah. You made it. You made it through traffic. How Thank you doing? You. Oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh. Um, we had the, the mic off there. there yeah, oh, I there did. you go. I can't believe the traffic. Or I'm sorry to interrupt. Jump in and interview. Don't oh, no, don't, that's don't okay. let me interrupt. I I was interested in your what you were talking about. Oh, oh no, no, that's this, it's this good is, to see uh, you. This is Jeremiah Higgins. He's the star of the show, but <laughs> we get mainly we just think, we tell him, Jeremiah. We tell him he's the star of the show. They tell me that. Yeah, then. <laughs> Oh, that's my, a good trick. Isn't that? It's they, they know how to inflate my ego. <laughs> we start off with a meditation and then <laughs> it makes him feel like he's the star. Right. Uh, yeah, okay. you should start off with a meditation. Oh, right. I, I, the radio station needs to add a helipad, I think, at this point, because they oh, make, every good. week it's harder and harder to get here. Uh, every stri uh, street was closed down this, this, this time. So, yeah, I need, I need some meditation to, and some warm tea. And you'd think, and you'd think with Santa Barbara, it's just a, you know, it's a quaint little town. You'd think it'd yeah. be easy enough to get around. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Back to your story. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but oh, nice no, to I see you. I was just talking about songwriting. Um, I want to say I took a songwriting class once with Susan Gibson. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know who she is? I don't. She wrote that Dixie Chick song called Wide Open Spaces. Anyway, and I was terrified like so nervous and just terrified so it's encouraging as like someone who's kind of sat in that seat like and you know your students just to start out with a meditation and and just the fact that you kind of understand where the writer's brains are at because that's really such an important place to start because I just remember just sweating <laughs> like so terrified to share my heart and what I write and then to like try to play my guitar while I'm doing that like with a room full of people right. and then Susan Gibson yeah it was just yeah and Meditation. and you know, there's a few and, and thanks for telling that story I mean there's a there's a few things that I think people immediately are at ease one is to write a, a write a good song, you don't need to be good at playing an instrument. You know, in fact, I've been to so many songwriting sessions where people's proficiency in an instrument is an obstacle to writing a good song mm -hmm. because they, they're used to going to this change and they've read this chart before and they can do this lick. And really uh, with a song, none of that matters. You know, I mean, it could matter in, in, in terms of a cool riff, but you really want to think, about the song beyond the performance of it, you know, how, how uh, the melody and, and the lyric is gonna go. So yeah, that, that's, that's first and foremost. And, and also the other thing I always love telling people, you know, sharing my views. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't claim to know anything I could tell them, but one thing that I have come to understand is that the song is smarter than you are. You know, we think we have to be super smart to come up with a song, but really there's this thing in the room that has more intelligence than we do. And it's to get out of the way and just kind of channel it. Mm. Sorry, it's uh, I got the uh, suburban gardener blow and go noise okay. outside. I'll close That's the door. Okay. We're gonna step out for a break uh, now anyway. This is a Jeremiah Higgins show. 
and Jeremiah might be here. We don't know. <laughs> okay. Mike, 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 Mike. I'll close the door. I'll close the door. Hold on. Yeah. I sneak out sometimes. So we're, we're going to take a break and we're going to take you to break with Luis's Made to Be Good. It's featuring Billy Harvey. Enjoy. I came in for the for the best part, the music. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. All right. We're, clear. we're clear. Stand by. Just Luis, so you know, even though he says we're clear, it's, a, it's a, initially a radio show. Therefore, we have commercial breaks, but we're on Zoom and we don't turn off the camera so we're on now we, we that'll the, the the breaks will run as as people will see behind the scenes or something i guess i don't know yeah God, I wish you, Mike so would you stop. edit this you edit this together with video no uh, uh, no the video will will appear on youtube and facebook um right. as a video the, the 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 zoom interview so if somebody tunes in and watches rather than listens yeah. Um, okay. They get the, the what happens in between the commercial breaks as well. Right. The reason the, the radio though and the podcast when it's uplo uploaded as a podcast on all the sites has all your music in it though. It's it's yeah. sound produced with the commercials that with yeah. you know your commercial nice. and all that. So oh, cool. that's the one to listen to rather than watch the video. But you guys are giving like, away all our secrets. <laughs> I tell you. Hey, can I ask how to pronounce your last name correctly? Because I be, Goffin. I'm gonna now Goffin. Goffin. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. I don't know how they could possibly not know how to pronounce your last name, but I, no, I, I I do, and I've heard it. I just wanted to make sure. It's like I just wanted to make. Sure. I wanted to hear your last name. You know, it's well. It, well, it could be. Go it's Finn always. Or... It's always better to ask than to screw it up on a live I broadcast. Suppose, I suppose. That is um, just so rude. Right. That that that's actually true. It is always better to ask than yeah. to. Yeah. Because, yeah. hey, know. it may be spelled G-O-F-F-I-N, but she might s pronounce it Smith. Mm -hmm. We don't know. <laughs> Maybe she's from the Czech Republic. And I'm, I'm never I'm never offended by that question. <laughs> I think it's a way better question than getting it wrong. You know? Exactly. So, and besides, yeah. I think, too, it's also showing great respect. There's somebody that wants in the room. Is that no, someone? no, that's not for the show. It's for the next one. I'll tell OK. You. All right. Okay. So, uh, are you ready to go back? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, shapes, and sizes. Yes, here we go. Live in three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back to the Jeremiah Show. We just brought you back in with uh, Luis Go uh, Goffin watching the sky turn blue. Back to you, Mike. Take it away. We were talking. It was really a cool aspect. We actually, we need to step back a little bit because we haven't really fully introduced Louise Goffin, but, um, and, and we'll do that in a second, but she was making a great point that the song is more intelligent than you are. And do you mind repeating a little bit about the theory behind that? Well, there's no real theory. It's just after years of thinking, um, well, you know, here's the thing. They always say like ego, you think, oh, I don't, that person's so egocentric. Well, ego is really insecurity. It's just insecurity just dressed up, you know? So when you go into songwriting and it's about, oh, I got to come up with this killer title and I got to impress this person and I want to, you know, you're thinking too much about those things. You're blocking the creative process. The creative process is really it has to do with listening and being led and you not taking up all the space in the room so that the song can take the space up in the room. And if you get with a couple of people and you're writing together, you're both saying, hmm, what, what does this song want to say here? Or you, you have a relationship where you go, I don't really believe you when you say that line. You know, I don't believe that line. Can we find something that feels more convincing? Because I don't really, I don't think that's, a, you know, so you're, you're really a truth meter yeah. you know that's that's to me the job of a songwriter is to listen catch it in the air and then massage it you know and make sure you're not leaving things that are inauthentic and just trying to be cool you know um but you still can be cool it's just make it real and truthful i want a quick question I was going to, going to just jump in just for a second, though, and go mm -hmm. back, as I said, and, and correctly introduce Louise. We haven't really gone through a little bit of background. I'm sorry to interrupt, Kat. No, no. Well, it could take longer than a minute because it's quite a background, but I'll go as fast as I can. Um, now, I mean, you've had, you got 10 albums of your own. You've produced a Grammy-nominated album. 
um, uh, which is, which is, and, and what's the, the, the theme to Gilmore Girls? You're involved in that. And, and was that a, as a writer or as a singer? A singer. Yeah, yeah. I sing the duet with my uh -huh. mom. Yeah. Yeah, and your mom is Carol King, so we might as well get yeah. that out of the way. Yeah. That's why I, that's why I was surprised you didn't know the, how to pronounce Goffin, because to me, Goffin King is like saying Elvis Presley. I mean, it's just those that that team, you know, blew me away as I was growing up, and and still does. So it's um, it's a magnificent background, um, and I'm sure had a lot to do with with what we're talking about today. I but mispronounce you know, everything, though, as you know, Mike. I mispronounce my own name. So. That's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but you've, you've worked with great writers and great singers. Uh, uh, I've got them over here. Rufus Wainwright, Chris Difford from Squeeze, who I worked with at A&M Records many years ago. Uh, ben Montanch from Tom Petty's band. Uh, and, and you worked with Van Dyke Parks, which is kind of a holy name among songwriters. And <laughs> Yeah, it's it's. It, I actually just got a note from Van Dyke yesterday. I was like, I I I have this total fandom thing going on. Like whenever I'm talking to Van Dyke or he's talking to me, where I just go into, is this really happening? <laughs> you know, pinch me now, kind of thing. Um, yeah, he he's lovely and uh, he's he's a a one of a kind one of a kind man he's a yeah. lovely man and his wife is lovely and uh his his son when we were doing um the recording for uh two of the songs that he did arrangements for on my last two albums his son came and filmed the orchestra it was lots of fun that's fantastic and, and yeah. uh, uh kat you were going to ask a question before i not too rudely interrupted no no, um, I was wondering, in your opinion, do, you were talking about how like the ego is really insecurity dressed up. And when you're by yourself writing a song, you're kind of alone in the room with your ego. Do you do you think that if you were to collaborate or when you collaborate with other people, does that kind of shove the egos out of the way? Do you kind of do you find like that sort of is maybe that piece of the process is maybe a little bit easier when you have more people collaborating on one Well, song. it's way easier for me, um, but everybody's different. Some people are natural collaborators and other people are just hermits and they just need to be alone, you know, and they, mm -hmm. it, it intrudes on their creativity to have someone else in the room. But I'm not one of those people. Um, my biggest problem when I'm writing by myself is not, actually writing <laughs> and that's it it's just if I'm by myself it's like oh I, I have to pay my bills and let me let me fix the Netflix on my you know I'll find a million things to do before writing a song because there's no accountability yeah. and um so you how know, do you get your butt in the chair what I don't I actually <laughs> don't I really don't but here's the thing I usually come up with ideas passing in the hall like I'll, I'll go I'm gonna play piano you know I'm just gonna sit down at the piano and just play for fun and then something will come out and I'll go oh that's an interesting you know shape I like these chords together then I'll get my phone and I'll record it and I won't do any finite editing I'll just keep playing it different ways I'll record it and then I'll forget it mm -hmm. and then sometimes I'll be lying in my bed and I'll play my memos from my phone and I'm like damn, that's a good idea. I really uh, love that. And I'll go back to things with an editing head. And at that point, it isn't so much sit in your chair. It's, it's almost like this flirtation going on with the idea. It's like, mm. ooh, I kind of, you know, and I'm kind of playing, playing this idea. Ooh, this is kind of cool. You know, show me what you got. And yeah. It's, a, it's amazing because sometimes I'll go to bed at 10 at night and just be like, oh, man, I'm glad I can hit the pillow. But if I playing with one of those song ideas, I could be up till two, three in the morning, not mm -hmm. get tired at all. Just, you know, completely engrossed in what's in this. What can I find? Something's in this that I got to find. I love that. We, yeah. we have another break coming up. Uh, Jeremiah, you want to take us to a, take us to some music. I, I love when Mike Gormley does an interview 
uh, on his own because I get to play what I really want to play is DJ. I get to play the music and I get to announce. So, so much fun. Yeah, this uh, we're going to take it a break with um, Louise Goffin. And this is Archives. Really great song. We'll be right back. Stand by. And I just have a comment I'd like to make about something she said too. If that's okay, Mike. Yeah, of course. I mean, Mike, you know, Mike's not going to get you know, any of his questions. Then. I know. Sorry. You want to call me tomorrow? What? When? <laughs> yeah. Give my give Mike back his interview. We that's all right. want we all want Louise. We all want your time. That's right. Louise, I don't think you met Richard. He's a engineer and evidently co-host. And this is Louise. <laughs> yeah. I'm 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 like digging his sound absorption panels behind him. Thank I'm you. like. Thank Those you, are really you. cool. They they look nice. Colors are, they? are cool. They're, they're very special. My uh, boss does not like, like them. Doctor. He says her sarcastically that they call me Dr. D, audio physician and interior designer. <laughs> he does not like the color scheme. He likes the fact that I changed out the old decaying soundproofing uh, pads that we had in here, but not thrilled with the motif. And what you I wonder see. if they make them in, uh, so you can see through them and put them on windows. <laughs> oh, now that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much sound they would absorb, yeah. but I don't know. I'm going to vent it. You there should. you go. That's what, a, I'll put, leave that with you, Luis. Okay. Okay. All okay. right. Ready? What you can't see, I got to say quickly, is right behind him on the panels are, are indents where he pounds his head after the <laughs> show because he's so. <laughs> We challenge him so much. I have a uh, I have an ongoing contract with the local spackle company to fill <laughs> oh, in those yeah, dents. Well, and well, let's and let... you could peel, peel one of them out, and that's where they deliver the drugs. It's that is you. That, <laughs> you know, well, she's finding out more and more about uh, our secrets. Uh, yeah, the radio right. station <laughs> secrets. Here we go. Three, okay. two, one. Welcome back to the Jeremiah Show. We're uh, talking with. Louise uh, Goffin today. It's Mike Gormley interviews, uh, but we, we came back with Sly and the Family Stone, Just Like a Baby. Louise sent this song to us, and I'm curious. I don't know if, Mike, this is in your questions, but w why the song is important to you and well, why we played I, it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I don't know if I followed directions because Mike said send songs, but they shouldn't all be your songs. They could be songs that influenced you growing up. And so I thought when I lived, you know, when I was about 10 or 11, we moved into this lovely house um, in Laurel Canyon and it had like cathedral ceilings and it was this turntable and all this vinyl. And, and I remember, you know, it had this great room and I climb up and put the turntable, you know, put the vinyl on and Sly and the Family Stone was a, a, a regular staple. Um, as wow. was Crosby, Stills and Nash and Ooh. James Taylor and Joni uh, Mitchell. And, and that oh, was yeah. that was just the um, the living room collection. Then I had my private <laughs> collection in my own bedroom. Those were probably all like Alice, Alice Cooper and David Bowie, you know. Oh, yeah. And those were probably all just the musicians hanging out in your living room. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's give Mike but back his show. You have I just had one quick comment. Not so much a question. I liked what you said when you said you were that the piano creating and you said, I, uh, I like the shape of this. I, I just like the term, the, the, the phrase that you use when you're creating music. I like the shape of this. That is really kind of cool. I can, it's like, I can hear color and I can see sound. <laughs> I well, really liked it. That's very much uh, how I go ab about it. Like I actually see, um, I see music geo, uh, geometrically, particularly at the piano. Like I, I'm not a trained musician at all, but I write really sophisticated changes and I have to figure out what they are later. It's like, what, what is this chord? How do I, how would I explain this chord to a musician? They go, oh, that's a, you know, augmented fifth, you know, C or, you know, mm. plus five. Well, yeah, augmented is that, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah, I can figure out what those terms are later, but as I was saying earlier, sometimes being proficient in music can be an obstacle to songwriting because you're not using your uh, sensory, emotional, you're like you wanna be navigating with your emotional sense of truth. Yeah, yeah. You don't wanna be navigating with, 
oh, I know what comes after this song. I played a million charts. And when you ha- hit this chord, it always goes to that chord. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. And now back to Mike Gormley. Oh, I'm me. Oh, uh, <laughs> hi, Mike. Mike, welcome, you, welcome to the show. you gotta, you gotta teach Jeremiah how to say my last name. Yeah, I know. It's uh, listening. Did I, I really say it wrong again? Goffin. Yeah. Goffin. There's, there's no go. It's not like stop and go. Mm, it's, it I rhymes with a coffin. <laughs> oh, like sneezing in a coffin. I had one job and I messed it up. All right. Well, we're moving right. on with Mike. Mike, Our take party. it away. So I don't know where we were, but um, uh, let me ask you something. You're on the show because of the many things you're doing. But, okay. But in your bio is this mention, uh, the cover of uh, your album, Two Different Movies. The cover was drawn by Joni Mitchell. And she gave it to you. You were age 11, backstage at a Carol King James Taylor uh, concert in Scotland. There's just not very many people who can say stuff like that, you know? And, it, and so let, what did your mom and dad want you to be when you grew up? What, what was they did that? not, well, I don't know about my dad, but uh, I think my dad wanted me to marry a nice Jewish lawyer or doctor and make sure that I was taken care of. Uh-huh. Um, that didn't happen. Um, and then- You take care uh, of yourself. <laughs> what? You take care of yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And when I was 12, a year after Joni Mitchell gave me and my sister those pictures, she did one for me, you know, sketch, 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 here you go. Sketch, 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 here you go to me and my sister. And um, a year later, you know, it was a year after my mother put out Tapestry. And I remember her being in my bedroom and like, really trying to have the talk with me to talk me out of going into music she she could see I had the bug really bad mm-hmm. I mean at that point I'd already been writing and you know um my dad had a recording studio I'd go down to the studio and he he'd be really salty with me on this he was really tough with me like it, like it wasn't like I was a little girl he was talking to it'd be like all right pick it up. We're rolling, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like no small talk. Come on, we're rolling. (laughs) And um, my mom tried to talk me out of it. You know, she's just like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, you know, and it's going to be really hard for you. And, um, you know, I think she knew following in her footsteps would be hard. Um, Has it been hard? I don't know. I have to say I had an immense amount of denial. Like I, I just, I just was always focused on I'm me, I'm doing what I like and whatever people out there think is none of my business. And I kind of ignored the fact that comparisons would be made, you know, rather than um, accept that they would be and deal with them. I, I just really was like, you know, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. But it was going on, you know, and then I'd be, uh, you know, annoyed if comparisons were, you know, if I'd been in the business already 20 years and they were still comparing me to my mother, I was just like, oh, please, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Um, and, And now what's so weird is that because so much later in the game, I look back and I realize that my first album and Tapestry were not that far apart in release dates. It's it's not like a generation, you know? It's It really is only eight years. Like she put out Tapestry in 71 and I put my first record out, you know, when I was uh, 19 in 79, which I made when I was 18. Um, and so with all this time going by, that's not a huge that's not like generations apart that's like kind of the same era almost so that's that's you know an oddity um also you know my parents were so young my mom had me when she had just turned 18 you know so I had really really young parents and and was 
um, in the throes of their careers and lives, you know, unfolding, not at a late stage when they had already made it, but I was there throughout all of the building of that career, you know, in the middle of it. So it was Rocky water, Waters to grow up with that. It wasn't like, oh, they have a career and they come home at the end of the day and then, you know, they're normal parents. It was just like, whatever, oh, what, uh, they're splitting up and we're moving to Los Angeles. And, and we used to live in a street where I could walk down the street with sidewalks. And now I live in a canyon with crazy kids who roll their parents' joints and take the bus to school. You know, I mean, it was just a lot of... Uh, well, on, on that note, we're going to yeah. take another break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> roll a joint. <laughs> roll a joint, take a break, listen to some good music. Inhale deeply, ladies and gentlemen. Inhale deeply. <laughs> the great stories, though. And, yeah, and great stories. Louise Goffin, yeah. Carol King, Where You Lead, I Will Follow, the Gilmore Girls theme song. All right, stand by. Let me load this in position. God, that's just unreal. That's very cool. Very cool indeed. Are there any, Richard? I mean, do we have we have one more break after this? No, this is the last break. So now you can just go so, until one. Uh, no, and and Mike, I got to tell you, I I just have I have I say this every time I do on some of these programs, not just this one, but others that I produce. I am, I feel like I'm continuing to get my continuing education in PhD because of the guests that are lined up. Just amazing. Okay. And we do have about 12, 13 minutes in this hour and no more breaks. And three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back to the Jeremiah Show. Mike Gormley interviews uh, Louise uh, Goffin. And we came back with, I'm not rich, but I'm not poor. Okay, there's a song. Oh, I got to get it out here. I put it aside, and and there's a song you call with this great line. Sometimes a circle feels like a direction. Mm. I love that line. Um, it's obvious, and it's kind of esoteric. Is that is that is that something that came? You were talking earlier about just walking down the hallway and getting a phrase. Is that something that just arrived? Or yeah, I mean, I I'm always. Uh coming up with lines. Um, that one was a while ago. I remember I was in, um, I think it was in Idaho when I came up with that. I remember writing the verse to that song in Malibu. I had taken my notebook and I went somewhere and I was sitting by myself having lunch out in the ocean, you know, looking at the ocean. Um, and I I just wrote on a page. She rattles the change in her purse and buys a little something to make her feel worse. She's got a boyfriend in Brooklyn. He's got a wife in Manhattan. You know, that was that was the verse. And um, and then I think I took a trip to Idaho with my ex-husband, uh, Greg Wells, who produced that record and, and wrote that song with me. And um, I, I have this memory of being like, at the dining room table and writing that lyric and him coming up with the melody for it and the phrasing. Sometimes it's sort of cool feels, you know, but I had had the line. So it was a good meeting of two minds, his phrasing and my esoteric lyric writing. Yeah. Is there, uh, Kat, any questions while we're rambling on here? I, I, I don't mean to interrupt or get in your way. No, oh, no, no, I'll jump, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, do you, um, I, I was thinking about what, when you were talking about uh, talking to new writers or maybe not even new writers, but I, I'm in a position at times where people are handing me songs, more so mm -hmm. in the past now, but it happens. And I always take them and I always listen because uh, I was a journalist. And when I wrote, I was handing over what I'd written to an editor and either getting torn apart for it or praised for it. Mm -hmm. But it was it was coming from here one way or the other. And songs even, even more so are coming from here. So they're handing you a piece of themselves in a way. Does that ever cross your mind? Do you ever feel almost pressure when, you know, someone is part of them that they're handing over to you to deserve some respect, even if it's terrible? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, the... the 
the more you do, the busier you get. And the busier you get, the more people want you to hear what they, they're working on. And I remember being treated so kindly by people when I did that, you know? Um, people just taking so much time with me and, and feeling so grateful for it. Uh, it. It's a real balance because at the, you know, on one level, yes, somebody is giving you their wares and their hearts and it means a lot to them for you to listen to it. On another level, I have to respect my time and I want other people to respect my time. Like I do so many things. I'm on the computer all the time. You know, do as, as uh, Jeremiah will tell you or uh, Richard, editing a podcast is a lot of work if you have a sense of quality and you want it to be done right. And I edit a podcast and I write songs and I teach- Is that how you're supposed to do it? I, I didn't know that. <laughs> And I am, you know, and I spend a lot of time on all the things I do, editing videos, you know. Um, so anything I'm in front of me, I really want to give all my attention to. And if people want me to hear things, I usually listen to it and I will write something back. But if they want like pointers, like how do I write a song? I think it's respectful for them to sign up for my class. And, and I, I create a forum where I am doing this. Mm -hmm. So if you are expecting me on my time when I have other things to do to give you personal pointers, then I don't know, you know, I think that's maybe not respecting my time so much, you know? You deal a lot in syncopation, rhyme, rhythm, meter, those kinds of things, or is it all pretty much intuitive? Oh, syncopation, rhyme, and meter is just like, it's, it's, it's second nature to me now. It has to be. I think lyric writing has more in common with drumming than it does um, poetry. Ooh, I like that you said that. I'm a drummer. That's, yeah, oh, like yeah. <laughs> I think that lyric writing is more in common with drumming than it does with poetry. That's that's my feeling. That's very interesting. Yeah. Can and one of the... On go ahead. Can you, what's, that, what's that mean, what you just said, in terms of drumming versus poetry? Uh, well, poetry the rhythm, is... The rhythm, right? The rhythm. Well, I've been told that poetry is no different than prose, except for the way that the lines are broken up. You know, you, you could take prose and you could put them on different lines and then you could call it a poem. Mm -hmm. But a lot of poets do... Uh, in terms of the content of what they're talking about, they are talking about deeper things like death, <laughs> like we're all going to die or the tragic nature of life, you know, this, this sad underbelly of life, you know, a lot of poetry is that or the beauty of nature. Um, but with songs, it, it's, you know, there's music involved and we don't want everything to be languid. We don't want, <laughs> we don't want pastoral uh, music, you know, and, and drumming is syncopated and goes across the beat, you know, like think of a, uh, uh, up in the morning and out to school, the morning teacher is teaching the golden rule, American history, practical math, you're learning the fad and hoping to pass, ring, ring goes a bell, you know, I mean, that's, that's what music, that's what lyric writing is to me. And Bob Dylan has that in spades too, you know, he's very, all his lyrics are, are, are rhythmic, you know, they, they sing rhythmically. Yes, they do. <laughs> they have bite. You got to have some bite in them. So uh, when you're in the studio, given what you were just talking about, uh, you, you have a producer and an engineer and your, yourself, and you may be producing as well. But do you like that? Was your producer, you like that the producer be a songwriter rather than uh, the engineer side? they'll understand what you're talking about? Uh, well, all the best engineers, uh, you know, they've been around music enough, but it, it depends on what their role is. If, um, you know, I, if you're strictly a recording engineer, your role is to not be in the way of what's going on in the room. You know, your, your role is to make this, the recording invisible so that, and, and have the artist and the band feel great and hear themselves really well and the signal is right and you're using 
you know, the right colored mics or no color mic or, or whatever. But, but an engineer producer is a whole other ball of wax. It's, it's really about um, bringing out the best in the artists and, and, and getting that excitement down, you know? Mm -hmm. have, you had a, have you had an engineer who is like, when you've come in and not been really feeling it, but you know you have this appointment and the engineer sort of becomes your cheerleader your motivator, your mentor, so to speak, because he knows that in order to get the best out of her, I've got to, I got to pump her up kind of thing. Well, first of all, let me say he or she knows because there's Beg way your pardon. more, Beg your pardon. <laughs> way more female engineers than ever. And we need fantastic, more of them. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just like we tend to say the word doctor and make it a man. And we tend to say the word recording engineer and make it a man. But, you know, women are mm -hmm. great engineers. We're learning. Fact, We're Al learning. <laughs> In fact, even Al Schmidt said that he had heard that, uh, you know, women have better hearing than men, because it, which which makes sense if you think about it, because biologically men are hunters, you know, so men have to look at the target, which is one target and shoot the target. And that's the meal for the family, you know, but women are the gatherers and huntresses and they have to be aware. They have the babies and they have to be aware of like all the dangers in the garden, all the possible, you know, wildlife coming. So it makes sense that our hearing would be, you know, on a broader scale and less on a focus scale. I just made better. I just made that shit up. I hope <laughs> <laughs> say we're better. Very well done. Very well done. I love it. I love Girls it. Girls rule. <laughs> My, when I was little, when I would argue for something, my parents or my mom used to say when I was really little, like I'm talking five, she would be like, oh, you're such a lawyer, <laughs> you know, because because I could argue well. Well, I can tell you that when I was hiring uh, uh, producers or board ops for the stations I worked for, yeah. I always wanted to hire women. Number one for the voice, because I wanted the diversity of voices because there were mostly men in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but number two, they got what we were doing inside the station in terms of how we were creating things. Whereas the guys, their egos would constantly get in the way. Oh, that awesome. Yeah, ego, egos in the way is really a drag. And I've experienced it before. And it's, it's, it's the worst. And yeah, absolutely. So please, if you're listening, hire, hire more women. Yes. And, and do not ever say you're really good for a woman. Don't Ooh. ever say that. You should be shot. Hung and, dra and cord drawn and quartered. Them fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> this is a peaceful and show. We need to, right. And we need to write a song, Louise, called Ego is a Drag. <laughs> we better give Mike his show back again. Though. That's right. That's it doesn't right. have much time left. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I like the title, Ego is a Drag. It's good. Yeah. I like it too. We're winding, we're winding down now, and, uh, and I have, in fact, enjoyed this conversation a great deal. And um, uh, thank you so much, Louise Goffin. For <laughs> thank you, Mike. Come back, please. And oh, okay, yeah. And and check out my podcast. I'm I'm actually I'm doing an interview with Bob Ezrin right now. I have amazing people on, and it's just like this. It's like completely chill conversation. Uh, it's like being in a room with friends and having a good hang. So it's, it's called, called Song. Song, Chronicle. Song yeah, Chronicles. Song Chronicles. And Very you did cool. before with Paul Zolo, uh, that was, what was that called? That was called The Great Song Adventure. Yeah, he and I did, I don't know, like 30 something episodes together. And uh, we had a lot of great interviews as well. And yeah, now I've just, it's kind of a solo venture, a, a new brand podcast. No, it's, cool. it's great. And, and Bob Ezrin, uh, one of the great producers of all time. Uh, so that's not, that must be great stories going on there. Hmm. Well, he's a great guy and I've known him a, a really long time. He refused to produce me when I was 17 because he didn't want to ruin my life. He said, I, she's such a nice girl. I don't want to put her in the music business. So, uh -huh. Funny. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a Jeremiah show. You want to take us into some music, Jeremiah? Well, yeah, we're, we've got a really, really special treat for you. We're doing our TGS World premiere of Luis uh, Goffin and it's two different movies. Enjoy. Thank you so much for coming on, Louise. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. Lots of fun talking to y'all. All, All right. right, we're clear. Okay. I'll All go right. back and Thank clean up my, my mistakes. 
When I get a notification that goes ding and I hear it here, do you get it there? No. No, we didn't hear that's, it. That's the, that's the beauty of the headphones. <laughs> there you and go. You've got it, and you've got everybody on different tracks. So Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming on pleasure. the show. Yeah. We'll let you know when it's going to run. It's usually uh, within a week or two. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, you, you, didn't so tell, you didn't tell Mike that after we record all this stuff, we just delete it? <laughs> <laughs> that would you. be a nightmare. I hate oh, when that God. happens. <laughs> I, I will fix what I said about I'll, I'll i'll fix your what i how i mispronounced in the first that's okay yeah you can just drop and, it in. and then and then it will look like <laughs> you guys made the mistake <laughs> well then you can then you can take us out correcting you yes yeah Actually, all right thank you sound, he's gonna make it sound like you're saying <laughs> <laughs> so sorry 